Welcome to the Let Off Podcast, episode five. This is another solo pod edition of the show. Um, you know what that means. It means we're going to get technical, but today is a little bit less of the deep dive, super technical stuff. Today is going to be a bit more friendly for everybody. I'm talking about archery on a budget. Today, I'm going to talk about every piece of archery equipment that you need from your bow, sight, rest, release, arrows, everything, and talk about how you can get the most out of these things on a budget, places that you can save money and places that you shouldn't cheap out. Um, I have some really good money-saving tips as well about some other finer details in archery, uh, just things I've come up with over the years and that have saved me a lot of money along the way. So this will be a very everybody-friendly episode. I think that um, everyone will be able to pull something from this and learn something and hopefully save some money because that's obviously important for everybody. So I'm recording this on June 10th. This is the day that episode four dropped this morning with uh, Taylor Lowen. Um, once again, I apologize for the episodes being a little bit out of order there at the beginning. Um, if you listen to the end of that one, of course, we were talking about, you know, first round of NHL playoff hockey. And now as I'm recording this, we're already in the Stanley cup final. So uh, things got a little bit out of order just as we were getting the show going. I needed to have a few episodes in the bank, but uh, things are going to be chronological now. And that's the way I'm going to maintain it going forward. So I've got a few show notes. Um, well, to start with, if you listen to the last episode, of course, my uh, NHL playoffs prediction was terribly wrong. I predicted that the Edmonton Oilers would lose to the Vancouver Canucks in round two. And of course, the Oilers play game two of the Stanley Cup final tonight. So when this episode drops two weeks today, we might have a cup winner. And I'm hesitant to even put a prediction out there. Um, but... I'm a Flames fan. That's all I'll say. Um, but no, of course, I'd love to see the cup come back to Canada. Uh, it's where it belongs. So um, let's get into it. Archery on a budget. I'm going to start right off the bat talking about a bow. Is the bow something that you can do on a budget, something that you can get for cheap and get a lot out of? Um the answer to this is yes, but I'd be careful with how you go about it. Um, it's absolutely fine to get a bow on a budget on, you know, Facebook. If you're buying one off a guy used or Kijiji or whatever, there's nothing wrong with buying a used bow, but it is important that you get it checked out before you buy it. Um, I would be so hesitant to purchase a bow online that's used from a guy and have him mail it to you and you give him money before you've ever seen it because what if there is you know a bent riser or a split limb or some issue with the bow that they're trying to sell to you um and you know once you give them money and they send it to you you never hear from them again so i would be careful about that um nothing wrong with buying a bow used i mean the archery industry is very interesting in the bow market particularly because there's a new bow coming out every year. It's very much like cars in the sense that, you know, every year a new car comes out the previous years degrade in value simply because they're not the newest anymore. So buying a, you know, 2019 or 2020 bow that's in really good shape um, is a great way to get what was a flagship model bow for a really good price simply because the bow is old. Um, I mean, my girlfriend's bow, which was my bow, was a 2019 or 2020 Bowtech Realm SR6. Absolutely fantastic bow. Um, when it came time for me this year to get a new bow for myself, I did a limb swap for her um, just so she could have a lower poundage, put new strings on it, um, she got a new uh, site. She kept my arrow rest, kept my stabilizer. And that thing is basically brand new. Of course, it's got the dings and a little bit of wear from hunting, but um, it's a fantastic bow that if I were to sell it, I maybe would get maybe six, 700 bucks for it 
with its age um and it's like it's a flagship bow it shoots as good as the twenty five hundred dollar bow that i just bought so um yes you can get a bow on a budget um i recommend going with an older used what once was flagship model versus getting a brand new budget bow because you know you can go spend that six seven hundred dollars and get a brand new bow but you're gonna get a much lower end bow typically something that it's going to have a very wide range of draw weight and draw length, which is great if you're a young archer uh, or if you're buying for your kids and you want the bow to grow with them. But, you know, as a grown man or grown woman, uh, you, you want something with a bit of a tighter draw weight and draw length range. Uh, they, they, the bows that have the tighter ranges perform better. They generally will offer higher performance with that tighter range so what you lose in adjustability you gain in tighter tolerances better performance um and you know typically what you're getting out of that is a a faster bow um, is what it comes down to just a faster more accurate bow um that's a another rabbit hole we can go down another day but that is my biggest recommendation to start off with with uh, uh a bow on a budget if you're looking to upgrade on a budget, that's uh, that's a good way to go. You don't need to get a brand new flagship off the shelf bow, although it's fun and cool. And I just did it, so um, don't want to be a hypocrite. Um, bow strings. If you're getting a new bow and you have a like a brand new bow, and you want strings on a budget, the best thing to do is not change your strings. Um, the factory built bow strings are completely fine. Now they don't stretch them as much as I like to stretch my handmade strings, they simply don't have the time. So with factory built strings, you're typically going to see a little bit of stretch over time, you know, but I'm talking a matter of years, you might see a little bit of stretch in the cables, which lowers your draw weight. Um, we've touched on this stuff before. Um, if you are needing new strings and you're trying to do it on a budget, my recommendation there is to not do it on a budget. Strings are something where you get what you pay for, Go with a high-end builder, someone who has endless positive reviews. Um, you know, if you're in Calgary and or Southern Alberta area and you want me to do strings for you, reach out and I'll, I'll happily do some strings for you in my shop. But, uh, you know, for the rest of the world listening, just do your research, put the money in. A good set of strings will last you years and years versus a cheaper set of strings that you're not going to be happy with from day one and you may have to replace in you know even under a year so moving on to stabilizer i guess you know a stabilizer is something i typically buy a good one and like it literally just lasts forever I've never seen a stabilizer break or get worn out or anything. I have a Bee Stinger 10 inch. I think it's a Pro Max Hunter. I love it. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's not a crazy high end stabilizer. I don't get into the whole, you know, rear bar stabilizer and, you know, all the different uh, crazy amount of customization options you can get into with stabilizers. I don't get into all that stuff. I buy one good stabilizer um and and call it a day and that's you know calling it a day for years and years because i know that that's not a piece that i'm ever going to have to replace so a stabilizer is something that i recommend just go out find one you really like that you know you're never going to want to change put the money into it and you know that's it it's not like bow strings or a bow where you're getting it and already you know within a year or so thinking about the next upgrade stabilizers not like that um now with some of your really cheap stabilizers what you're gonna see is they're very heavy throughout the entire rod which is not what you want if you are trying to find a stabilizer on a budget i'd recommend you know don't just buy one online unless you can see what the material makeup is you want ideally a carbon rod because the way a stabilizer is designed to work is to put all that weight far out in front of the bow, as far out in front of the bow as possible, really. That's why you see, you know, in the Olympics, their stabilizers are like four feet long. Now, that's just not practical for hunting. But the way we can get 
close to that as hunters without having a four foot stabilizer is we use like a carbon rod and then the weight is all out on the front because carbon is very, very light. So it screws into your bow. There's like this, you know, six, seven, eight inches of carbon that doesn't weigh much at all. And then all that weight is far out in front. And that's like what my bee stinger is. When you use a cheaper stabilizer and, you know, there's even some really expensive ones out there that are just heavy throughout the whole unit. It kind of takes away the purpose of a stabilizer to have that weight be really evenly distributed through the whole stabilizer. That's not what you want. You want all the weight out on the front end. Um, you know, buy yourself a stabilizer like that and it will last you forever. Now, arrows. I feel like I'm beating a dead horse on this one a little bit because um, I just did a YouTube video on whether or not you need 0.001 arrows, which is a straightness grade. I know I mentioned that in a podcast recently here. Um, you know, I'll touch it again. Arrows are something that some people can do on a budget and some people can't. If you have a really, really long draw length, like max draw length, you're not able to cut your arrows off at all. Like my friend Robin Warman, he's got like a 33 inch draw length. He's shooting full length arrows. He can't cut them down. He needs to spend more money on arrows to have that high end straightness grade 0.001. If you're someone with a short draw who's cutting six or seven inches off an arrow, you can buy the cheaper, lower straightness grade in quotation marks, like 0.005 arrows. And you're cutting off so much that you're going to increase the straightness of that arrow just as a factor of how much you're cutting off of it. So unfortunately, that is not a topic that's one size fits all. Um, but in general, for most people, Arrows are something that you don't need to spend crazy money on. You don't need the match grade, you know, $350 for a dozen arrows if you're just an average guy. Um, I don't use those types of arrows. I've never used those types of arrows. I've built them and of course they work fantastic, but I've built a lot of budget arrows too that work just as good and have killed a lot of animals and punched a lot of X-rings. So um you know, the, the biggest thing when it comes down to accuracy with arrows is that your spine is correct. Um, you can get, you know, a phenomenal arrow build out of a cheap arrow if you're putting it through a program such as Archer's Advantage. If you're really taking your time to build the arrow properly, square off your ends, clean the insides of the shafts, do a really meticulous job fletching, you can take a budget set of arrows and work wonders with it. So, I, I mean, I've covered arrows so deeply. Um, I'll move on to release here. The release is a thing that you can and you can't cheap out in the sense that there are options that don't cost a ton of money that are really good, but they're few and far between and you got to know what you're selecting. If you've ever looked into the release market, you know that they can be incredibly expensive. I'm talking $500 for a release is not out of the question. Now, I've never spent $500 on a release, but what you get out of expensive releases versus cheap releases is typically travel in the trigger. As archers, we don't want travel in the trigger, whether you're shooting a handheld or an index release. Um, I don't really deal with resistance activated or hinge releases, so I'm not going to touch on those. Um, but, you know, anything with a trigger as the function, so handheld or, uh, you know, wrist strap index finger release, a really expensive release is not going to have any travel in the trigger. So basically it won't move at all. You'll apply pressure, apply pressure, apply pressure, and it'll fire without that trigger ever actually moving even a millimeter. A cheaper release, as you start to apply pressure, the trigger will move a little bit before it fires. And some of them can have a considerable amount of movement. And what that does is it, um, it, it tells your brain when the shot's about to go off and it can induce target panic and flinching. So as archers, we really do want triggers that don't have travel and that's what you're going to get out of the high end releases. Now I'm a huge fan of spot hog when it comes to releases and I'm not sponsored by them in any way. Uh, I just love them because they are really on the affordable side and they have that 
micro adjust zero travel trigger. And that's another thing you'll get out of uh, some of the higher end releases is that you can adjust the, they call it the heat of the trigger. So to, you know, turn up the heat or make your release hotter, you're decreasing the pressure necessary to make that trigger go off. Um, and a, a high end release will have a very wide range of, you know, cold to hot, um, lots of pressure versus not very much pressure. You can make it a hair trigger, whereas a cheaper release sometimes doesn't have that option at all. Or if it does, it's not very reliable or consistent. So I'm going to plug spot hog, you know, even though they have no idea who I am, I've used the spot hog wrist straps, the wise guy, that's a phenomenal release, which I might be going back to. I'm currently using the, I think it's called the Saturday Night Special or Whipper Snapper. I can't remember. The releases always have, you know, funny names, but one of their three fingered handhelds and it's fantastic. I have no issues with it other than that. I can't keep track of it. And that's, you know, not a fault of the release. That's a fault of my own that I can't seem to keep track of my handheld release. But um, that's a definite plug for, uh, spot hog releases. They're one to check out if you're looking for a good release without spending four or 500 bucks. You know, I think I got my spot hog handheld for around a hundred bucks Canadian. So that covers releases. Now I'll talk about sites and rests as well. Both sites and rests are something that, you know, if you buy a good one, it isn't going to need to be replaced. Rest may be more so than a site just because it's got moving parts and it's that movement is being repeated thousands of thousands of times. A rest and a site are typically something I do put good money into. Um, particularly with the site, I believe that you can buy a good site, spend a few hundred dollars, and that site will last you for many, many bows. My last site, which was just like a standard mount, you know, the two two holes on the side of the bow. I had that on three or four bows for many years and it was amazing. The only reason I got a new one is because uh, I wanted to move to the Picatinny mounting system that the new bows are offering. So again, I bought a pretty high end site and I expect it to last me basically until they come up with a new mounting system, which uh, who knows what that'll even look like or when, or if that ever happens um, in archery. So Personally, a site is something I like to put good money into, uh, but again, you don't have to. With a site, things that I would keep in mind are um, from the mounting plate, like the, the part that actually goes on your bow and attaches to your bow, get aluminum or carbon. You don't want a site that's made of plastic. It's not a consistent material in the sense that, uh, you know, weather can impact plastic and how it's fitting to your bow, regardless of how tight you have it uh, mounted on there. Um, I've seen plastic sites break in extreme cold. They're also often hard to micro adjust when you have a site that has plastic components. When you have aluminum uh, or carbon machined components on a site, they're much easier to micro adjust. And when you get out to 60, 70, 80 yards, um, it's going to be really crucial to be able to make those really fine adjustments on your site. Um, one thing I look for, you know, for me, it's a non-negotiable in a site is I want micro adjust pins because I shoot right now. I'm shooting five pins on a movable site. I used to shoot seven pins totally fixed. And, you know, when you're getting out to 80 yards and I need to make a micro micro adjustment on that 80 yard pin, uh, I, I need a micro adjust site. I don't want to be fumbling around with Allen keys and trying to hold it steady and, you know, overcorrecting and moving it back and forth and, you know, blah, blah, blah. So for me, that's a non-negotiable, but if you're someone with the patience and, you know, you don't want to spend that money, just get yourself a site that has aluminum or carbon components, um, not plastic site pins and not a plastic mounting base, and you're going to be good to go. Uh, if you want a good site for, you know, you can spend 120, 130 bucks, you can get a good site that'll last you for a long time. And again, the used market, some people really try to get 
all their money back, it seems, when they put things on the used market, which I understand. But at the same time, it's the used market. So, uh, you know, if you are buying a used bow sight or used ARS, don't pay close to what uh, what you'd pay at a store because you're getting someone's used equipment. You don't know what it's been through. And I see a lot of people out there putting their equipment up for, you know, basically what they paid for it. So um, just understand what it means to be in the used market versus go to an archery shop with that stuff. Um, and arrest. Arrest is, a, again, something I tend to not cheap out on. Uh, but at the same time, I'm such a big fan of Whisker Biscuit Arrow Rests. I know, you know, Archie Nesbitt, he's one of the greatest bow hunters that ever lived. He's used a Whisker Biscuit Rest forever. And he's got like 380 species with a bow. He believes in them. So many other bow hunters believe in them. And you can get a good Whisker Biscuit for like 40 bucks. Um, of course, there's the higher end options that most guys are using, the dropaways, the uh, limb driven dropaways, cable driven dropaways and and so on. But a rest is really not something you have to spend a ton of money on. My recommendation would be if you don't want to spend a lot of money, get a good whisker biscuit arrow rest rather than getting a cheap drop away rest. A cheap drop away rest is going to be again, made of plastic for the most part. Uh, it's not going to be as consistent and repeatable as something made of aluminum or carbon components. Um, and, you know, it's going to be prone to breaking. Rests are much more prone to malfunctioning and breaking than a site because of their repeatability and how much they're cycled. So that would be my biggest recommendation. If you don't want to spend all that money on a, you know, a three, four hundred dollar arrow rest, which is what the highest end ones cost, get a high end whisker biscuit spend 60 bucks on one and again that's a component that doesn't have moving parts it'll last you forever the thing you need to be aware about with a whisker biscuit uh the biggest thing is just not shooting too heavy of a helical with whisker biscuits i tend to recommend shooting three fletch versus four because you have less contact um, as your arrow and veins go through the whiskers and the same kind of thing with helical. If you're shooting a really steep, like three degree helical through a whisker biscuit, you're getting a lot of contact on the face of that vein, uh, on the face of each vein, really. So just something to be aware of, like the whisker biscuit does have its limitations, but those rests were designed to be shot with straight fletched arrows for minimal resistance. And they work tremendously well. Yes, even out to long range. Um, when you have them paired with the right, you know, arrow setup and fletching setup. So um, small helical, you know, half a degree, a degree, that's all I shoot. I only shoot a degree helical on every arrow I build. Um, that'll be fine through a whisker biscuit style rest, but don't be shooting a three or three and a half degree helical or offset through one of those. Uh, it will impact its performance. So that pretty much covers all of the pieces of a bow um, in terms of budgeting, how you can budget, how you can save money, if you should save money or if you should put the money in. Now, I have two really cool tips for you, small money saving tips that I've used for years. One is on arrow wraps. Everyone knows that arrow wraps suck to buy just because they're expensive, um, but we kind of need them. Um, and for those that don't know and aren't familiar, an arrow wrap is basically a sticker that you put on the back end of your arrow that you then fletch over top of. So instead of putting your fletching directly on the carbon of the arrow shaft, you put this sticker on and you fletch on top of it. it serves a few purposes. Um, first of all, it makes your arrow easier to find, easier to see in flight, easier to see on impact. But the biggest thing is that if you shoot a vein off or a vein tears or whatever, and you have to replace the fletching, it's easy to peel all of them off, put a new arrow wrap on, and you're basically have a brand new arrow. Versus if you fletch straight onto carbon, you end up having to scrape off glue and scrape that vein off of carbon. You can shave carbon off and weaken the arrow. Um, get You can get carbon splinters from doing that. And it's just not pretty. It's not ideal. So an arrow wrap is a really good idea, but they can be expensive. So one thing I do is instead of buying the standard four inch arrow wraps, which is what most 
compound archers are using. I'll buy either a six or an eight inch pack of arrow wraps, and then I'll very carefully measure out and cut them all in half. So I'm getting, you know, double the arrow wraps out of one purchase. So when you buy arrow wraps, I mean, usually they're about a buck a piece and the price difference between a four inch, a six inch and an eight inch is marginal. But if you spend that extra dollar or dollar 50 to get the eight inch arrow wraps, so right now I'm using six inch. So then I cut them in half and now I have three inch arrow wraps, which works just fine. Um, you're essentially cutting your cost of arrow wraps in half. So that's a interesting little money saving tip for you. I'm going to give you one more lighted knocks. I used to use lighted knocks when I first got into bow hunting, like a decade ago, because they're cool, right? I was a kid and it's like, what's cooler than seeing your arrow fly through the air, like a laser beam. And I quickly stopped using them because of how expensive they are. Like it's not unreasonable to pay 10 or $15 for a single knock. So recently when I started to do my new bow build and, you know, kind of relook at the way I do everything on my bow, because for so many years, I just hadn't changed anything. What I was doing worked. But uh, I, I, as I got more into this YouTube and podcast thing, I thought I need to start playing around and keeping up to date with uh, what's going on out there. So I have more to talk about. And I went on Amazon and I bought all of the cheap no name, like, you know, don't look like you're even going to get what you, they say you're ordering uh, lighted knocks on Amazon. I bought them all and I found there is one that is fantastic. They're called D power D E E P O W E R uh, all one word. I found them on the American Amazon site. So for the Canadians out there, you have to order them from amazon.com and man, mine took like, two months to get here. Um, but I weighed them all. They were all identical in weight, like down to the 10th of a grain. They all are very consistent. There's none that are dimmer or brighter than others. Um, the knock fit was really good with the, the way I build my strings. I mean, that is going to be a little bit different for everybody, but for me, the knock fit was really consistent with knocks I've been shooting in the past. So I'd imagine for most people, they'd work really good. And they're easy to turn on and off. Most of the ones I ordered were garbage. Like I, I got a few six packs of other just knockoff brands that some of them wouldn't even turn on. The weights were completely inconsistent. The knock fit was completely inconsistent. But those D power ones were fantastic. I ordered a whole bunch, super cheap. Um, that is a money saving tip. I actually think John Lusk reviewed those on his YouTube channel. I think that's how I was turned on to them. Um, but yeah, those were, those are a bit of a game changer because those lighted knocks got me back into shooting lighted knocks. So that wraps up the archery on a budget discussion. But as always, I'm going to do the listener question portion of the show. Um, and you know, everybody, please keep writing in your questions. It means a lot to me to see them come in, helps the show be what it is. I know that there's a lot of people who reach out who say, you know, I didn't have questions going in, but hearing you answer other people's questions teaches me so much. Um, so when you write in a question, you're not just getting an answer for yourself. You're helping everybody else who's listening to this show. Um, and it, you know, helps make the show what it is. So keep writing in your questions to the let off podcast at gmail.com. Uh, let's get into this one. The first one is from Phil Madonna. I think Phil was uh, one of the first questions I answered in the first episode. Um, Phil says, because there are so many YouTube channels out there talking about heavy FOC, as I get older, I drop my poundage and I still want to have a good penetrating arrow. So, a question given my situation, when's the right time to drop to a lighter or less stiff shaft? I know there are manufacturers guidance about what pound you're pulling versus what shaft size to get, but there's a lot of gray area when jumping up or down in stiffness. What's a good FOC for a hunting setup? And does that change if you're shooting a lower poundage? Um, thank you so much, Phil. Uh, you know, the very first thing is that 
you got to refer to your manufacturer's spine chart, your arrow manufacturer's spine chart when you're talking about getting new arrows. You know, you got to figure out roughly what your arrow length is going to be. And what you, and the way you can do that is have someone stand beside you while you draw your bow, get to full draw, finger behind the trigger so you don't shoot your friend's finger off with your bowstring. Um, but get them to measure from the knocking point, like the string, not the D loop, because that'll add, you know, half, three quarters of an inch. So from the string where it pivots and you would knock on to the end of your arrow rest and take that distance and add, you know, three quarters of an inch to an inch. And that's roughly what your final arrow length is going to be. And you can use that to look at these spine charts. Take that plus your draw weight. And then that'll tell you what spine you need to buy. Of course, you know, that's your static spine number. That's the spine that the arrow shaft is made to be that you can't change that number. Your dynamic spine is something we change moving forward. You know, when we, when you cut a quarter inch off your arrow, it stiffens your arrow. When you add 50 grains to the front end, it weakens your arrow and so on and so on. All of that stuff is figured out using the online software that I talk endlessly about Archer's Advantage. Again, not sponsored by them. I've just used the product for like a decade. Love it. Never had an issue with it. But that is how you find what shaft you're going to take into that deep dive arrow building process. Now, one thing that's going to happen a lot is uh, you're going to look at these spine charts and see that you could use either like, for example, a 350 or a 300 spine. If you're ever between spines, go with the stiffer spine because arrows weaken over time. It's always better to be slightly over spine, meaning slightly too stiff than too weak. If you are right on that cusp, you can... And, you know, you're not someone who wants to do this uh, software, arrow building stuff that I talk about. Take the stiffer spine. So if you're between 350 and 300, 300 stiffer, add an inch to the shaft versus what your old cut length would have been. So if you'd been shooting a 28 inch arrow before, get the stiffer arrow and add an inch. So now shoot a 29 inch arrow and that's going to balance out. Um, but give you that stiffer shaft so that as your arrow weakens over time, it'll still perform optimally. Um, so when's the right time to drop to a lighter or less stiff shaft? You know, when you're ready for new arrows and you drop your poundage, you just have to look at that spine chart and see, uh, you know, it's, it's something that's going to happen to us. As we all get older, you're going to have to drop down. Um, there's nothing wrong with shooting low poundage. I killed my musk ox, you know, one of the biggest animals in North America at 49 pounds because I was nursing a shoulder injury. Accuracy is the biggest thing in archery. You know, if you're someone out there that's nursing an injury and you need to drop weight, don't worry. Just be aware that your old arrows aren't going to work when you drop weight. Um, you need a new spine. You realistically, if you change your bow's draw weight two pounds, that changes the dynamic spine of your arrow. And, um, you know, it's something you need to take into account. So, um, what else did we say here, Phil? Um, what's a good FOC for a hunting setup, man. I don't know my FOC. I've never measured it. I don't care about FOC simply because, uh, I'm going to build the arrow the way I build it. And then when I'm targeting a certain weight or rather speed, um, I tend to target, you know, I want my arrow shooting 270 to 280, 290 feet per second, somewhere in there. I'll shoot the heaviest arrow I can to maintain that speed range. If I'm going to add weight to slow my arrow down or take away weight to speed my arrow up, it's always going to come off the front end. And that's what's going to change your FOC there's nowhere else you really can change the weight of an arrow. So for that reason, I don't measure FOC. I just build my arrow to target the speed, to target the weight that I want and whatever the FOC is, whatever. So don't worry too much about that at all, Phil. Um, and does that change if shooting a lower poundage? No, because you're, you're just going to use a different spine and you're still going to, you know, probably use a hundred grain point and, you know, lowering poundage you're probably going to just use the the standard insert that comes with the 
arrows because you're now you're going to be wanting to shoot a little bit faster as a result of lowering your speed you're going to want to shoot a lighter arrow to keep that speed up so don't worry about your foc at all phil but thank you so much for the question and good luck to you with that uh one more question this one is from tyler from bc what are the first pieces of equipment you need to start your home shop uh thank you tyler First pieces of equipment. Well, the very first thing to do to start your own shop is get into arrow building because the barriers to entry are minimal. You can start with, you know, some glue and a Bitsenberger fletching jig and, you know, a mouse pad for applying arrow wraps. And that's really it. The barriers to entry to get into arrow building are very low. And that is how pretty much everyone starts DIY archery. Once you get past that, you know, you can get a bow vise for not that much money and you can start doing, you know, detailed arrow rest installs, sight installs. You can do your center shot. Um, you can you can do a ton of stuff. You can set your knocking points just with a vise, just with having something that can hold your bow in a very fixed position for you. You can, you know, you can tie your knock sets, tie your D loops, um, endless. But there will come a point where you need to buy a bow press because you'll need to make adjustments to cables and to your string. And that is a big barrier to entry for a lot of people. One thing that sucks about DIY archery is that, you know, if you're just getting into it, one of the first things you have to do when you're setting up a bow is time it. And you can't time a bow without a bow press. So, you know, if you're serious, once you once you get past the arrow building phase, if you love this like I did and you know this is something you want to do, get a bow press. You don't have to spend a ton of money on one. I shoot the basically entry or not shoot. I use basically the entry level one from Last Chance Archery, the easy green. And I've used it for, you know, approaching a decade and I've never had an issue with it. It's worked on every single bow I've ever used um on it and used it on rather and uh you know i think it's probably about 400 bucks There's, i'm guessing at that um but you don't have to spend two thousand dollars on a one of those big crazy uh x presses or anything like that so you know start with your arrow building stuff get a vice but you're gonna run into a point where you need a press and you know don't hesitate just bite the bullet do it you'll never regret having a bow press, it totally opens up your world. And once you have a bow press and a vice, there's basically nothing you can't do um, in DIY archery. Um, you know, make sure you have the basics, make sure you always have D-loop material on hand, make sure you have, you know, a few good sets of Allen keys. But, uh, you know, you'll need those fundamental pieces of equipment sooner or later, and you'll never regret uh regret getting them once you have them and you're going to have uh your phone's going to start blowing up with your friends asking you to work on their bow. Uh, that's uh, one of the first things that happens to everybody when you get a bow press and it's not a bad thing at all. I've made a ton of friends um, with people who needed help with their setups and, you know, turned into a business for me. So hopefully that helps Tyler. Thank you for the question. Um, that's going to wrap up episode five here. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening episode six will be coming at you in two weeks and that's a cool one i have my buddy adam brennan he's a canadian from the yukon he's a traditional boat hunter he's you know he's a mountain man long boat hunter he's an expert on trad archery the level of detail that i talk about compound archery he does that with trad archery so he you know we get into all sorts of stories and he's got some incredibly crazy you know, close encounter grizzly bear hunting, for example, that's a story he tells on the show. And just if you're someone even interested, remotely interested in traditional archery, or you're deep into it, and you've been waiting a long time for a traditional archery podcast, or, you know, some form of content from me, this is it. Uh, everyone knows that I don't know traditional archery at all. And I won't pretend to Adam does. He's the expert. We spent like two hours together. Um, and that was a that was a big one. I learned so much. So stay tuned. Two weeks. That one will be coming out. Uh, thank you again for the support from everybody, from our title sponsor, Tooth of the Arrow Broadheads. 
Um, and of course, please keep writing in your questions. It helps make the show what it is. The let off podcast at gmail.com. We'll talk to you guys in a couple of weeks.